I'm Lucien Hudson, Director of Communications for the Open University. It is my great pleasure to warmly welcome you this afternoon to the valedictory lecture of Professor Simon Buckingham Shum. We're joined today in the theatre by Simon's family, his wife Jackie, his children, and many esteemed friends and colleagues. We're also joined by many more from across our nations and regions who are watching the live webcast. We're all gathered to celebrate Simon's work and research over the last 19 years and to congratulate him and wish him well in his new position with the University of Technology in Sydney. If you have your iPhone with you, please spread the word of Simon's success at hashtag OU underscore inaugural. Hashtag OU underscore inaugural. Please join me in welcoming the Vice-Chancellor, Martin Bean, who will give the opening remarks. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. They uh, chose me uh, to give the opening remarks because of the Australian accent to make Simon's new family feel at home for what they have to get used to in Sydney. But it's an absolute, absolute pleasure to be here. I, uh, when I saw the list of who were giving these lectures, I grabbed this one for myself shamelessly because I just wanted to be here because we're in for a treat to actually hear Simon, Simon speak tonight. Uh, it's just, it's wonderful every time he presents. And, uh, and I'm so pleased that his family is able to be uh, with him here today. Um, and of course, a very warm welcome to the professor himself. Uh, it is great to have you here, uh, Simon, and to really celebrate your work in sort of learning informatics. You know, when, uh, when you were made a professor and we were batting around what wonderful title we could give you, I thought, what a, what a just an appropriate way to describe the contribution that you're making. And I, I'm lucky because Simon and I knew each other well before I started at the Open University. We rocked up together in uh, beautiful, sunny Southern California to a conference that the Hewlett Foundation was running, a, a global conference where really global meant everybody else was American except for Simon and a couple of other people from the Open University. But it was all about um, where was this thing called social learning going? So they brought together sort of some of the great thinkers in the United States, philanthropic, university, private sector, private equity people. Remember that conference, Simon? It was really interesting. And I arrived in, um, not really understanding what I was getting myself into, as a representative from Microsoft. And it was just so clear to me, after about 30 minutes in that room, that probably had sort of 60 people in it, just what a rock star Simon is and just how much... Not only does he know about his area of expertise, but what a compelling way he has of bringing that to life for people from all different backgrounds and walks of life, even those of us crazy enough to be working at Microsoft at the time. And so, but it's also how I got to know the fantastic work of the Knowledge Media Institute, of which Simon is a part of what we affectionately refer to as KMI. KMI was created back in 1995 by a small group of visionary OU staff some of whom I'm delighted to say are here with us today, to put the OU right at the heart of innovation in information technology and learning. And that was back in 95, and oh, what a wonderful... Jeff, I think it was John, under John Daniels' watch, that it was started. I think it was your executive that came up with the idea at the time. And, and boy, I am so glad you had the vision to start KMI, because much of what has kept the Open University um, at the forefront of innovation in, in learning and teaching, particularly at a distance, has been driven out of our great institutes um, and faculties. And KMI certainly, with the responsibility of really doing the horizon scanning and looking at what's next, has done just a, a remarkable job. And today in 2014, as I said, they continue to lead. And Simon was one of the bright young researchers, I did stress young there, Simon, uh, recruited 19 years ago to help kickstart this new venture. Uh, and it became apparent pretty quickly that he was going to do great things. He came to us from the University of York, where following in his father's footsteps, he had studied psychology. Um, he was a people person, not a computer scientist. Not that I'm saying that those two things are necessarily mutually exclusive for the people in the room, but he had been inspired by that visionary inventor and internet pioneer, Doug Engelbart, I believe. Is that accurate so far, Simon? Um, and Doug got Simon thinking, what if computers could help people 
to get smarter? What if computers could help us unravel complex debates and get to the truth? What if computers could help us work together to solve some of humanity's most pressing problems? And these are all pretty big questions. But Simon's come up with some suitably big answers over his 19 years with us. He's now a world-class researcher in the field of learning analytics, collective intelligence, and argument visualization. Since 1997, he's secured external funding of nearly two million pounds for his research team. And that's not counting the $10 million awarded to the OU by the Hewlett Foundation for Open Learn and Open Learning uh, Network. And I believe he's one of his partners in crime, Patrick McAndrew, is sitting right there, who is right there with him as they bid and delivered on much of that uh, to the Hewlett Foundation. What's more, Simon has always been passionate about making sure his research provides very real benefits to learners. OU students have Simon to thank for tools such as Lyceum and Compendium, along with Cohere in its development, the evidence hubs currently being piloted to connect students, researchers, and practitioners. But most of all, Simon has played a leading role in shaping the three biggest leaps the OU has taken in the field of social learning, open learn, social learn, and now future learn. He's made a key contribution to OU strategy and management as Associate Director Technology of KMI, academic lead on learning analytics, and a member of no less than four OU steering and advisory groups. All this as well as playing key roles in numerous external bodies and organizations and, and supervising a total of nine PhD students. As you might expect, Simon is passionate about learning at all levels. As chair of governors at Bushfield School in Wolverton, he's worked with two head teachers to introduce innovation and creativity into a crammed, exam-driven national curriculum. And most importantly, he's been a lifelong learning husband to Jackie. You get to rate him on that one, Jackie. And dad to their three junior researchers, Joe, Jazz, and Tom. Uh, and to the three of you, I know you've got this big move ahead of you, um, but you're going to a great land, uh, and we, we know that you're just going to have a wonderful time. And I know everybody in the audience just wishes you and your family all the, all the very best of, of luck. And I won't be too far away, so if it's not working out, give me a call. Um, <laughs> uh, he's been working in a new role, director of their Connected Intelligence Centre, which is all about making the best use of data and analytics to provide a world-class student learning experience. And, and that's what he'll be doing when he moves on, says he, to, uh, to my alma mater, actually, um, the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, which is where I graduated from. So Simon and I are going to run some probability algorithms as to what it took in our lives to mesh in so many, so many different ways. But I actually studied adult education at UTS, and you're also going to an institution that has a very, very proud history um, of understanding how to make a difference in the lives of not just 18-year-olds, but I attended as a working adult, and it truly transformed my life. So you're off to a, a good place, Simon. And as I said, I honestly can't think of a better person for the job. Um, although he'll be distant geographically, I'm pleased to say that Simon's work will continue to have an impact on us here at the OU, um, because it really is some of the most important work on the planet. Computers and the internet are giving us unprecedented power to combine the insights and creativity of many different minds together with vast amounts of information. They offer perhaps our best hope for solving some of the most pressing problems humanity faces today. The big challenge for all of us in education is how we can best prepare our students for this hyper-connected world. And I think that's really important. We had a massive debate, a good one, constructive debate, in our final council for this academic year today where analytics was foregrounded all around. It's one thing to have the data. It's one thing to be able to create incredible inferences from the data. It's another thing to be able to structure direct interventions with the data. But if you don't do that in an ethical, transparent, trusted way with the student at the middle as the beneficiary, not some other third party stakeholder, or how dare we, the university as the beneficiary, it could all go very wrong. And I think one of the things that I'll just leave you with about Simon and the team that I've worked with um, at KMI is that despite how much of their work is done around the cold, harsh reality of analytics, information, technology, machines, they never lose sight of the fact that ultimately 
It's about making the lives of human beings, no matter where they are on the planet, better through education. And what a wonderful gift Simon and the team give us in making sure that we stay at the forefront of all of that information. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, uh, both a colleague of mine, but also a friend of mine, Professor Simon Buckingham Shum, and his lecture on making thinking visible in complex times. Simon, congratulations. We will miss you, but I'm sure we're in for a treat. Thank you very much. G'day. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. That was very kind. I appreciate that. It's all right. I'm not going to wear this for the whole thing. Thank you, Care Mai, for my silly hat. I shall arrive at Sydney wearing that. So it is, uh, it is amazing to be here, slightly surreal. You know, I've been at these before and seen other people doing this, and suddenly I'm stood here. And that's, that's, that's pretty weird, but it's also great. And I do appreciate you all coming. And you know, as I look around, I'm seeing so many faces, uh, so many collaborations and projects that we've done together. And uh, that means a lot. Thank you. It's also great that we got Mark Eisenstadt, Paul Baxish, Kitty Chisholm here, who uh, created KMI. Um, and um, we also have Tom Vincent in spirit, who sends greetings from Snowdonia. And here is Tom uh, pulling the flag up at KMI uh, and keeping the spirit alive. And that's, those are the huts that we started off in in KMI. Some of you may remember that, where the science building is now. And I came here... Uh, I'm in my 18th year here, nearly 19th, uh, as a research fellow, um, to this amazing place that I'd read about and um, thought, wow, that sounds, I mean, it's the sexiest name of any place I've heard of anyway, quite apart from what the people are going to be like there. And it turned out to be an amazing place. Let's just recruit good people, give them the best possible environment possible, and let them do great stuff. And uh, that's always been the spirit in KMI, and um, one that I'm sure will continue. Um, uh, it's also great to have my family here, and it's also pretty terrifying to have to try and give a talk which will appeal to three generations and keep them awake. Uh, but there will be lots of movies, and they will actually be helping me make some of my points, though little do they know this. Um, unfortunately, my dad isn't here. He died a, a few years ago. Uh, but uh, Granddad John, who grew up in Hong Kong, emigrated, and set up life here and became a psychology academic himself um, at what is now Glasgow Caledonian University. And um, it would have been great to have him here. For him, academic life was the highest form of existence. I'm not sure if I share quite that extreme of view, <laughs> but uh, uh, he was an inspiration for me. I wouldn't be here now if it, if it wasn't for him, I shouldn't think. So, hi, Dad. And um, here is Dad at UCL um, in the 50s in the early British space science research program. Uh, dealing with some uh, complex data coming through from the early British uh, satellite program. Um, this was actually a promotional shot uh, taken by uh, the, the company just to show how up there they were uh, in, in supercomputing. Um, and this is, of course, the subject of the talk today. It's about how we can use computers to inquire and learn more about our very complex, interesting world. And... Um, I'm going to be talking about inventors. I, I, I see a lot of inventors in KMI. I, I feel like an inventor myself, as well as doing all the academic stuff. But we love creating new stuff and just seeing what's possible. But uh, we invent tools, and we're going to be talking about people who build tools, not to build things out of bricks and steel and glass. We're going to be talking about inventors who build tools to build ideas and to make ideas visible. And uh, you know, ideas are very hard to get your hand on. Arguments are very complicated sometimes. It's very hard to see an idea. But how would it be possible to actually see what someone's saying, literally? That's been part of my challenge and excitement. We're going to start the story at 1968. There's lots of history for computing before then, but we've got to start somewhere. You don't know how much history I've already chopped to try and get all this in. <laughs> OK, it's 1968. People are used to thinking of computers a bit like what my dad was doing there, looking at ticker tape or maybe punch cards. Computers are used for doing big sums, basically. But in 1968, 
the most amazing demonstration was given. It's called the mother of all demos. We love giving demos in KMI. We love to bring people in and blow their socks off, and they just say, I didn't even know that was possible. So picture the scene. It's San Francisco. It's the annual autumn conference. It's December the 9th, 1968. I'm 18 months or so. Um, uh, people are in universities. They know what computing's about. It's ticker tape. It's big number crunching. And this guy, Douglas Engelbart, is going to stand up and show them that computers are about ideas, about creativity, about joining complex information together. And luckily, they had a camera running. He's up on that big screen. The hall is packed. And this is what they saw. My office, I have a console like this. And there are 12 others that are computer supplies. And we try nowadays to do our daily work on here. So this characterizes the way I could sit here and look at a completely blank piece of paper. That's the way I start many projects. His screen so is behind system, him. That's a good okay. start. I'll His image is superimposed like that in. on top of so, it. I'm sorry about that. Live demo, something always goes wrong. <laughs> so I'm putting in an entity called a statement, and that's full of other entities called words. And if I make some mistakes, I can back up a little bit. So I have a, a statement with some entities' words, and I can do some operations. Exciting operations like copy and paste. <laughs> you saw delete there. He thought of something, he typed it, he changed his mind, he undid it. Nobody had ever seen that in their lives. Can you imagine what it looked like? Right? You want something typing? Call your typist. Or just dash it out on the typewriter. Okay? For the first time, ideas are appearing on a screen at the speed you can think them. All right? Check this out. We've got a collaborative document. We've got two people using this weird thing. When you move it on the table, this marker on the screen moves with you. Oops, let's play the video. You can talk to each other and point, and maybe later I can hand you the chalk on this blackboard, like saying, here, you control it. But let's stay this mode now and add another feature that hardware-wise is available to the kind of display we have. I'd like to see you while I'm working on it. So before I can do that, I have to set up my display in a certain way. Set it up so it, I see it over like that, that leaves a corner up there, and I say, now, computer, do the automatic switching that will bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected. Audio. Wow. <laughs> Collaborative editor, video conferencing, all in the same screen. We take this for granted now, but can you imagine what it would have been like to see it for the first time for people who really didn't think computers were good for anything other than, you know, filling large rooms and, and doing very big number crunching? So suddenly, we are, we, this is a paradigm shift, okay? This is, this is truly amazing. People have never seen anything like this before. And as uh, Martin said, Doug's obsession, this is uh, after the war, he's come out, he's been working, trying to figure out what can we do to avoid another war? What can we do to solve the very complex problems facing society today? And this was his mission statement. We need better tools. He actually talked about augmenting human intellect to tackle humanity's complex, urgent problems. We don't get much bigger than that. Okay, that's the mission statement. And complex, urgent problems have hardly gone away since 1968. Here's a great acronym from the US military, if your situation is VUCA, then you've got trouble. Okay? This is now part of the lingo in a lot of strategic thinking in organizations. It's constant white water. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous, it's very hard to predict the future. You need completely different management styles. Manuel Castells talks about leaders being faced with just so much information, an extraordinary revolution in technology, but we've got so much information, but we're still bewildered. It's not like more information helps, right? We've got information coming out of our ears. More information is not the answer per se. Informed bewilderment is how many of us walk into work 
um, thinking, I wonder what's going to be announced today. All right. Obviously, our job is to try and stay on top of that in, in, in R&D labs. So what happens when the world is complex and changing and you need paradigm shifts more often than you would really rather like? We start with what we know, with what's familiar, what feels comfortable, and we are facing some kind of transition into the unknown. It's going to be a bit strange, and it's going to be probably a bit uncomfortable, because we just, we just don't know the rules of the game yet. Okay? This is what we're facing as a family as we move to Australia. Okay? Um, it feels a bit strange and a bit uncomfortable. And the less you know about what's coming, the more uncomfortable it's going to get. And there's a word for that. It's called liminal space. Lyman is the word for threshold in Latin. Okay? When you cross the threshold between somewhere and you don't know what's coming at the other end, that feels uncomfortable. In fact, human beings do not like that state. It's deeply unsettling and people don't cope very well. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest, one of my heroes. Liminal space, he says, is when you've left the tried and true but have not yet been able to replace it with anything else. When you're between your old comfort zone and any possible new answer. If you're not trained in how to hold anxiety, how to live with ambiguity, how to entrust and wait, you will run. Anything to flee this terrible cloud of unknowing. Now, he was actually writing in the aftermath of 9-11, when the States was in shock. And, uh, you know, the rules of the game had changed, clearly. He writes about liminal space, though, as something that many of us face in our personal lives. Uh, if we have a, a severe loss, or you've suddenly been diagnosed with cancer, or some, something terrible happens, often you feel like, I just don't know what the future's going to be. Okay. And, of course, there are less serious versions of that. A new job, a new boss, a new place to live, um, a new paradigm, a new announcement from the Minister of Education. Right? <laughs> Whatever it might be, the OU is facing this all the time, okay? But this is, this is important for learning. So some colleagues I was with in Washington just um, uh, last week. So while we initially strive to make our students feel comfortable, that's very important, we must then help them balance their desire for security and with the need to take risks and explore new ideas and possibilities. Rather than attempting to resolve the tension this creates, a college, and we might equally say a school, should help students find, this place, find their place in this precarious threshold in the liminal space between the familiar and the strange. Okay? You can't make it go away. The only way to make liminal space go away is just to say, it's okay, you can come back to your comfort zone. Or it's to find ways of navigating it um, and saying, when you get to the other side, you will be a different person, but hopefully you'll be a stronger person. So here's a profound question for educators. Uh, never mind managers or citizens. What kind of person will survive liminal space? Uh, maybe what kind of person will even thrive in liminal space? Because it's not going to go away. It's just, it's just going to become more common. And uh, what's technology got to do with all this? Can it help us navigate a VUCA world? Or is technology just making things worse? It's just accelerating everything. And you know, many of the, 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 the big shifts we get are disruptive because of technology. OK, let's fast forward to 2000. Doug Engelbart has been lauded and awarded every award possible under the sun in the world of computing. There he is, bottom right, in the White House, receiving the National Medal of Technology from Bill Clinton. People have recognized what he had to, to contribute. What do you do after that? You come here. You stand here in the OU at the Beryl Lecture Theatre giving a Care My Lecture, next best thing to Bill Clinton in the White House, I guess. <laughs> so we had Doug, stood right here. It's quite... It's quite odd to be standing here. I was so pleased to introduce him and explain to him what he's doing. And you're actually seeing an early version of the uh, webcast interface that KMI developed. So Doug was here telling us about his vision. And he didn't come to invent the mouse. He didn't come to invent hyperlinks. He didn't come to invent Windows, video conferencing, editing on screen, or graphics. That was just by the by. Let's just in invent personal computing on the way to something much bigger. There's a lovely mural that was done of his work. I'm just going to zoom in on the whole concept of raising the collective IQ. So he was absolutely 
um, convinced that we had to learn to think better together. The problems are too big for one person to try and solve. You cannot solve what's called a wicked problem where people can barely agree on the definition of the problem, never mind what might count as a solution, by just unilaterally imposing a solution. People have to work together. They have to have a sense that they have co-defined and owned whatever the, the way forward might be. And so even back then, you know, it wasn't that collective IQ came a bit later on. Back then, it was all about how do we improve our collective intelligence. Now... How's this played out in KMI? Well, we thought one day people are going to be talking online for free. Almost the first thing Mark did, I think, went, was uh, license one of the emerging voice on the net technologies so that we could start playing with this idea that people are probably going to talk on the net for free one day. We couldn't really figure out quite how, but we better start experimenting. Okay. More. They might even be doing stuff together like sketching ideas. Well, actually, of course, Doug Engelbart had already shown us that. But how could normal people get access to that? Well, the OU knows a bit about this. I can write on there and correct it. Now, that's the sort of thing you can do with this light pen, but you can actually send that signal down a telephone line. And let me show you how that might work. Let's see if there's somebody on the end. Oscar winning performances. Hello? Hello? Hello. Oh, David. It's Graham. Uh, are you all fixed up for your meeting in Bedford this week? No, I've never been there before, actually. So if you could explain how I get there, that would be very useful. OK, fine. I'll try and draw you a little map. I'll have to clear the screen. I've got something on this end. You're all fixed up at your end, are you? Yes, I'm all connected. Right, OK. Uh, well, now, um, you should be able to find the bridge over the river in the centre of Bedford. Um, and that's the River Ouse. And then there's the Market Square and the High Street. And... So, we can use technology for some very big ideas, like sketching a map about how to get to the OU Centre in, uh, in Bedford. Um, so there we have it. I'm sure that guy's Tim Brick Taylor, actually. Um, we could do this in 1979 with an early system called Cyclops, actually, working with BT and sending stuff down the line to a regular TV. Um, and, um, you know, so we were getting there, but, you know, I, it wasn't really deployed. But in KMI, we then worked on um, uh, something called Lyceum, which gave us um, an environment. It was one of the first Java programs, and it was running on 56K modems, okay, installed on students' computers, down the phone line, real-time Java groupware with voice on the net, scribbling and um, annotating documents together. And uh, we have a couple of examples here from languages who were always some of the earliest adopters of our new technologies. You know, talking on the net, live, in groups. That's pretty revolutionary if you're trying to learn a foreign language. So the OU got a big head start on learning how to use tools like this to help people connect um, synchronously. Of course, now we have Illuminate, Google Hangout, all the rest of it. But there we were uh, in the late 90s, able to start understanding the pedagogy around this as well. Uh, I was, you know, I've had an amazing time stumbling around my hard drive looking for stuff and came across this old report I did for the B823 team, the managing knowledge team in OUBS, whose uh, vision led by Paul Quintus, to use Lyceum as part of the environment. And we had a, you know, I did a lot of training with ALs, uh, training them how to use this to tutor and, 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 and um, getting their feedback on this. But that was a, a great example of how KMI then worked with LTS uh, and with um, people within the business school to create a solution to something that um, uh, we never imagined doing a few years before. Another example of this new medium that Doug Engelbart was trying to create. How could we make any page discussable? We want to, you know, talking is incredibly important for developing ideas. But the web in the early days was very static. You didn't really do much. You just sort of viewed stuff, downloaded it. Um, but we were very interested in how talk and discussion and debate should be happening on the, on, on the web. So we created something called D3E, the Digital Document Discourse Environment. And we tried to create a very simple interface. What's the website? Paste your link in here. What would you like to have a discussion about? Paste your discussion topics there. Press the button. Bingo. There you go. There's the page. There's the article. And here's the discussion forum with the threads that you said you wanted to have a discussion about. So suddenly, you know, we can make something interactive. There are, of course, more uh, you know, advanced technologies now for doing this. But this was an early version. And um, if you actually had the document then you could process it even, even more richly. 
Um, this is sort of in the late 90s. We launched the journal. Diana Lorillard launched a new journal called Gyme, which is still going today, based in IET. And the idea was to showcase what's possible with when scientists share their ideas on the internet. And so we would process a document, and there's the document on the left. There's the article that's being reviewed. Um, it's you know The table of contents was generated automatically. There's the discussion space on the right for discussing it. And the toolkit picked up all the any citations and linked them to their entry there. It picked up any headings and created a discussion thread so you could talk about section two here. And that was just by processing it through one toolkit. So that got used within the OU, um, as well as uh, to set up other journals. And Tammy and Mike, who worked with me, took that back to Boulder, Colorado, and drove it forward doing science digital libraries work there. What about the idea that ideas and arguments don't exist in our heads as prose. It's just this connect, connected network of ideas. Um, and and, and, and we, we simply write traditional documents because that's the way you, try, you write. But what if ideas and arguments could actually exist as networks on the internet? So we created a piece of software called Compendium. And I, in fact, this came from the States, from my colleagues there who worked with me. Um, uh, and we, we developed it, we released it open source, we had funding from the research councils, and it developed in quite a robust tool. And here's how it works. On the left here, you, you have the issue. This is the question that you're discussing. On the right, next to it, is a connected idea, which says, here's an idea we've got about how this might work. The idea might have cons or pros that support or challenge them. There's an argument that challenges that idea, but supports that one. And this one actually has been made into a decision. We've had a discussion, and we're going to go for that one. And in fact, that icon is a handshake because we worked with Andrea Berardi uh, and colleagues in technology who work with indigenous people in Guyana, helping them have a voice about how their land is used. And we were using ex compendium and experimenting there. We used to use the, the gavel icon to mark a decision. They said, oh, over here, when we make decisions, we shake hands. We thought, that's actually a much better icon. That's where the handshake icon came from. Um, there's a whole story there. In fact, behind every slide, there's a PhD or a three-year research program, and I've had such difficulty trying to keep this uh, uh, down. Okay, so let's have an example. This is from my colleague Paul Colmsey in Perth, brilliant mapper, brilliant consultant, a SharePoint wizard as well. He's teaching his children how to do this, right? So his 11-year-old is learning how to map discussions in the family, um, and, and, they've, and his 11-year-old has got a, a sister. And, uh, sorry, our little brother, Liam. Liam wants a cat. Now, the background to this is that um, Ashley, his sister, already has a cat called Jessie. Uh, Jessie has also been taught not to eat the fish from the pond. <laughs> All right. We're going to have a... And uh, Liam wants a cat. Why, sh why should Liam have a cat? Because, well, Jessie reckons that... Uh, sorry, Liam thinks that Jessie could have a cat friend. And Liam wants to play with it as well. But there are some downsides to Jessie having a friend. They might fight. And Jesse may not want a friend. Why would they fight? Well, because cats sometimes don't like other cats. This is, right, this is important. Okay, what are we going to do about that then? Aha. Santa can talk to the two cats to be friends. <laughs> In the business, that's known as a killer argument. Okay. So we can map discussions at any level. We can do this in families. Uh, we can do it about deciding where to go on holiday, and you can subject your children to all sorts of tortures as an academic. <laughs> right, now that's a simple set of moves that has actually stood the test of time in, in, in a very resilient way. And when you add that into a hypertext tool that allows you to connect them, then it can go a long way. In fact, it went so far that we had to create something called the Compendium Institute to support the global community of people who are using this tool annual workshops, people sharing templates and maps. Uh, we had uh, testimonials from people from all over the world that we didn't know were using it. It became one of our impact case studies for the REF. What does it look like when you're not having a discussion about can I get a new cat? What does it look like probably at the most extreme collaboration scenario you can imagine? NASA want to send men to Mars, maybe women as well. Okay. How are the scientists on Mars going to work with their colleagues on Earth. The distances are too great for real-time communication. The guys on Mars need support, advice. They are planning. 
How are they going to send the rover out? Will it get there in time? Will it run out of energy when the sun goes down? All sorts of complex stuff. They're doing geology. So NASA worked with us and said, we want Compendium to be the science database where we maintain this web of connections of ideas, rock samples, photos, voice notes, satellite images, the, the works. We thought, wow. So they go off to, to Utah. They live in a habitat like that, which is a prototype habitat where they study the psychology of living together in a you know, um, enclosed space. They get dressed up in space gear and try out voice, voice commands to the robot. Um, they've got a little robot trundling behind them that they're trying to get to take photos when they tell it to. Right? So this is big boys with some very big toys playing at being spacemen. And they are out in Utah on Mars, and we're back here at home working with colleagues in Southampton and Edinburgh, and we're on Earth. And Compendium is going to be used in many different ways. It's going to be used to map the discussions between the scientists on Earth, between the scientists in Mars. It's going to be used for the scientists and Martians to communicate with each other. And it's also going to be used to communicate with, with software agents as well. So here we have an example of a map. They're discussing geology photos. We can zoom in here. So um, there's, there's a rock sample, that's been, a photo that's been taken on Mars. The Earth team have commented on it, asked a question, and the, and the, the Mars-based team have replied. And they can swap these maps to and fro. And I was one of the mappers in this project. Very exciting. We're working on Mars time. We're getting very tired. We're making mistakes. It's a very good simulation. This is a map actually built by scientists to be interpreted by software agents. Right? So basically, robots can read that map. It says, this is where they have to go, how long they have to spend there, what they've got to do when they get there. And when the scientists are, um, are gathering their data, and when the robots are, t are get taking their data, there's a panoramic photograph of the whole Martian landscape. All of this comes back into Compendium. So the, the robots are creating Compendium maps. And you can see all the different metadata here about, about that. What's more, we needed a way of trying to understand what was going on on Mars. We would wake up, they'd gone to bed, they'd had a planning meeting, what's been going on, and what do they want advice on? So we created a replay tool that allows you Today to see, have, uh, there they are, in the habitat points. you saw. We have an aerial map. You're looking at their so screen. They are um, mapping their ideas. The Down here is the timeline. You can jump to who spoke when. And there's also a timeline for all the compendium nodes. So when you jump here, it's to see the question, sample bag, nomenclature. So you can jump around and see when they talked about a particular topic in the meeting, when they made a particular decision. Why did they make that decision? Why did they not go for that other option they've been thinking about? Okay. And then we integrated that with the access grid subsequently, another video conferencing environment. So now we can browse meetings by ideas, not just by scrolling backwards and forwards. That was quite exciting. What else can you do with this quite simple DNA? Well, you may remember in 2010, we had the first ever televised debates amongst the prime ministerial candidates. And I was sat in my living room with my laptop on, and I was mapping it. And then I would put the maps up on the web an hour or so afterwards, and they got quite a bit of interest. And we created a replay that looks a bit like this. Only now, you you're starting to take... Uh, now yes, you're you're only starting just it's before the, the, an election no, to take three, steps three that need ago. to be taken. Three I'm going to bring Nick Clegg in now, and we'll continue. Well, well, Mr. Clegg. I, I think this is partly what's been going wrong for so long. Which we've had both major parties running governments over the last 20 years talking tough about immigration and delivering, delivering complete chaos in the way in which it's run. See, I agree with uh, Nick. An, an arbitrary national cap will not work. I agree with Nick. So, uh, Gordon Brown said that quite a lot. Um, and, and you saw, you can see, as they say something, I'm mapping it, capturing it succinctly and connecting it in. So at a glance, you can see who said what, who was agreeing with who about what, who was mainly disagreeing in this map with who. Um, and uh, you can see Nick Clegg sort of stepping back and saying, oh, it's the same old left-right polarization. What we need is a fresh approach. Uh, and, you know, it's quite hard to remember, but he was really impressive then. Um, and <laughs> this got the attention of the EPSRC. So we now have a three-year project, um, and it's called the EDV project, Election Debate Visualization. When those debates go out next year, we will be mapping those. 
We will be analysing them. We'll be showing the kinds of rhetorical devices the, speak, the, the, the candidates are using. We'll be showing who agreed with who and disagreed with who on what topic. All sorts of other ways of replaying the debate that gives you insight and which might change your views about what happened. Certainly a little bit better than a sort of emotional who won based on some sort of you know, mood worm that's floating up and down. So you know, we're working closely with Leeds University on this. They are part of the discussions which are shaping up those debates right now. It's quite exciting and we've got a hard deadline to hit. Another um, thing I love doing is working with artists. Um, you know, Doug Engelbart was conceiving a whole new medium for working with ideas. And, and people who work with new media and understand what makes a medium strong or weak, you know, we call them artists often. And here I am working with uh, choreographers who do really interesting work playing with time and space using digital technology. So they do their thing. We were using Compendium to try and understand, um, can we help them plan their sessions? Or, as it turned out, can we help them annotate what's, doing, what's going on in a session? So here we, we drop in video to Compendium. And now we can annotate video by putting icons on specific locations as well. But it also turned out to be a great way for people like this, who do in multimedia work, to communicate what they do. You know, right, when you're a choreographer, you don't want to write a boring paper with a couple of photos in it. They do, actually, because that's the way we have to do things. But they were really looking for a whole new medium that would make their work come alive. So here's an example from Sita Popper in Leeds talking about a piece. Um, she's been working with street dancers in York, and she uses technology to enhance the dances. Oh, go back. Play. If we can start the video again. And we see here a football game of light. And again, I've got a little icon here that allows us to understand a little bit about how that design uh, was devised, what we did uh, in, in the processes of creating it. And if I just start the video again, in a moment you'll see a rollover icon there which gives us an image of the creative process uh, and the testing that we went through while we were creating it. And what we also have here is a link which takes you through to another project that was an offshoot of this particular project where the football game became the Five Courts game. And if we also double click on here, it'll take us to a web page where we can see some images of that later project, Five Courts. So there you see some of the hypertext aspects of the medium. You can link, you can have things popping up on the timeline, uh, you can roll over to zoom in and out. Um, other things you haven't seen there are the fact that you can tag nodes, so you can sort and filter them. Um, and, and for them, it provided a whole new medium to communicate what they do in a way that they felt was truer to what they, what they care about. Okay, so you've seen some examples of mapping real-time discussion, um, where you're kind of driven by who says what when. Okay? I don't know what Nick Clegg's going to say until he says it, and then I've got to link it in somewhere. Okay? Um, but you could be stepping back and just looking at a debate in a more leisured way, probably as a student perhaps, and thinking, well, I've got to dissect this debate. I really need to understand it. So I'm going to um, embarrass Jo now, who at the age of nine brought home from Bushfield School her literacy homework, um, which was all about persuasive argumentation. I thought, aha, right. <laughs> at last, some homework I understand. <laughs> okay. Your parents have decided that you watch too much TV. They're going to let, limit you to half an hour a day. In the speech bubbles, can you list arguments for and against the ideas? So what we have here from Joe are things like, that's great, I'll have more time to play. It'll give me more time to get ready for my uh, uh, dancing, I think it is. It'll give me more time to uh, cuddle my guinea pig, um, and so forth. And down the right-hand side, what are the cons for being limited to half an hour a day? Uh, but I'll miss loads of TV programs that I want to watch. Uh, but I can get dressed really quickly. But I hardly ever watch telly. But I hate homework. <laughs> now, there's something strange going on here. Have you spotted it? All right? Not all of those arguments against are against the idea of watching telly for only half an hour a day. Right? We, so... Being a knowledge mapper who uh, uh, can put his children through torturous experiments, we had to create a map about this. 
So there's the, uh, there's the statement at the top, the context. There's the key question, the burning question, and the proposed approach. And I, I showed Joe some examples and said, look, this is what a knowledge map is. We did a little practice one about going on holiday and why, why would we want to go to Germany and not California or something, right? And then I just sort of left her to it and went out in the garden. And Joe transcribed her pros and cons into the map. And as you can see... You know, but I can get dressed really quickly for clubs is a challenge to that pro. But I hate homework is a challenge to that con. So we've got some conceptual clarity here that you don't get in, 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 in the simpler view. So that's a, a sort of simple example of argument mapping. Okay? We're not trying to map in real time here. We've got a problem. We're exploring some options. Okay, let's scale this up. So I did some work looking at racism on the internet, and went and spent, I had to actually tell IT in the OU that I was going to spend a lot of time on the National Front website, so I didn't get blacklisted. Um, so here we find a scientific argument on the National Front website. Brace yourselves. What are the facts? Impressive list at the bottom of sources. On every measure of intellectual ability and educational attainment, blacks perform significantly worse on average than whites. In the case of average IQ, for example, the average Negro figure is only 85% of the white average. Impressive sources at the bottom. And many people are clearly persuaded by this. What's going on here? So as you read through the argument, we can start to tease out some of the things. In fact, they have a whole bunch of counter-arguments which they then tackle. Some people say these tests are unfair. They're written by whites in a white society and it's, ba it's biased against non-whites. Oh no, Chinese and Japanese, who are, noticeably more who are not noticeably more Caucasian, do as well or even slightly better on average than whites. Oh. oh, well this is due to the environment rather than innate heredity. So for example, we know that blacks tend to come from more deprived environments. Other groups from deprived environments perform better than blacks. So, you can see what's going on here. It's a, it's a classic rhetorical device. You mount an argument, you anticipate counter-arguments, and you knock them down. Right? Pretty convincing stuff, right? Especially as every statement there is backed by what looks like a scientific reference. So we can dissect an argument like that. Turns out that one of the primary sources is called IQ and the Wealth of Nations which has had a lot of criticism, you can see in the red nodes here. Criticism of who the research funders were, criticism of dubious data sets, data set sources and their accuracy, criticism of the subjective statistical manipulation by authors. You wouldn't find that on the National Front website, of course. I had to start doing some digging around, um, actually a very good Wikipedia article about this. Right? There is a live debate about IQ testing and whether it's biased towards whites, biased against blacks, but of course you'll get only part of the story on a particular site like that. But at least we can start teasing it apart. I can go off, I can drag and drop those links in, and I can show why I think they're important. So it's not copying and pasting from Wikipedia. This is me going off, finding sources, and then showing why I think they're important. How do they fit into the bigger picture? And there's a sort of zoom out that shows, you know, you can, you can get quite detailed with this. Okay, so that's an example of how we can step back from an argument and make it visible. Um, and, and sort of look at it in a more dispassionate kind of way. doesn't mean you find the truth. doesn't mean you find the right answer. There may be no right answer, but at least you can see why are you making the claims you're making, and it's much more permeable and porous for people to target a particular node or statement and say, I disagree with that. Okay? A prose is very dense. It's very intimidating as well. It's, it's hard to get into. Right? Now, Compendium has, done, um, has, has been taken up within the OU in, in quite a few ways. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, you know, I came to KMI to try and make a difference to the, the student experience as well as to do research. If you go to compendium.open, you'll see the kinds of things we did. Um, we, we, we surveyed the use of Compendium for the Pro Vice Chancellor for teaching and learning at the time. There's a report there. It's part of OpenLearn. Uh, it was used to create a, a timeline for psychology, the history of psychology. Uh, it, it was integrated with Moodle so that you could um, uh, launch the lab space edition of Compendium and share your maps in Moodle. Uh, Dronya Connell and her team in the learning design 
uh, group uh, in IET, customized compendium, so that you could start to see, you could educators, course teams could ask, well, what is, um, uh, what is it that, that we want the learner to learn? What is the activity? What is the learning output? You just started to map it in very precise terms. They even added a timing estimation so that you could get a sense of how much demand was going to be made on the tutor and the student. So I was, I was delighted when they, they started working with Compendium on that. U101, the award-winning design studies course. Another interesting strategy for uh, you know, disseminating from a research lab into mainstream, LTS hired their own programmer who basically stripped out any, any functionality that they, weren't in, they didn't want to see in Compendium, and then they made it available. So here the students can post, as they're doing a design project, they take photos and show the process they went through um, and document it. Then they, they upload that through a, a, a modified ETMA submission system. The tutor opens the map in Compendium, annotates the map, and sends it back to the student. So again, very satisfying for us to see this add real value to U101. And in fact, they won the best product award in, in the Scottish E Assessment um, uh, Award Ceremony last year. There's Derek Jones getting it. So things like that are great. I mean, this is partly why, it's what gets me out of bed as well. I don't just want to invent a prototype that will run and blow someone away on one machine. I, I really care about trying to create software which is robust and solid, and I have my lead developer, Michelle, to thank for that. Um, so it's been a strategy of trying to get repeated funding for a tool that makes it actually the, the tool of choice for many people. Now, that's a desktop tool with people doing mapping on their screens and, and, and maybe publishing to the web. But what if we started to use the web and share these ideas natively with each other? So what if researchers started to share their ideas as webs of ideas and arguments? And we started working on this, working with John Demang and Enrico Motta. In 1999, we had a, an EPSRC project. And we said, why has scholarly communication basically not changed since the first journals were published in 65? Sorry, 1665, <laughs> right? We still ship around digital replicas of bits of paper. Is this the most effective way, Doug Engelbart would ask, of sharing what we know, of finding when somebody's got a new result, etc.? What if we were to shift to a network native representation, to the idea, you know, I mean, it even looks a bit like a sort of conceptual network in someone's mind. You know, if this is how you think about your literature as a researcher, shouldn't you be able to actually show it like you see it? And so we started to work on the idea that instead of the situation we have at the moment, which is that you have a paper there, there's a paper in a journal, say. There's another paper in a journal. And the first paper cites the second one. That's what we do at the moment. Uh, the computer has no idea why it's being cited. It's very hard to make sense of whether somebody is agreeing or disagreeing with somebody else. At least it was back in the late 90s. Um, uh, late 90s. Things have moved on a bit, as you'll hear. Right? Now, there are three key ideas associated with that publication. One of them is called WUFIS. You can see what it means. And there's another key idea called information foraging theory published in the Green paper. And it turns out that the citation is because WUFIS applies that theory. Okay? We have a method that applies a theory. And that is what we, we call the claim. So that is a significant scholarly move. I've got a method I've developed, and it's using this theory. And a computer can understand that. And that's quite interesting. Okay? Now, what if you were to start doing this on the web instead of, or rather, probably in addition to writing all those bits of uh, prose text that we have to do at the moment? Well, here's an example from a tool that we're working on right now. On the left, we have an, uh, a discussion forum. In, uh, it's in Germany about sustainability of some sort. Um, and we have they have embedded, just like embedding a YouTube movie, they have embedded the map of the debate that somebody has been creating. And they have been into a source document here. They've clicked a little button in the toolbar of their web browser, and they've highlighted a passage. It's like getting your electronic highlighter out and saying, that's important. They've grabbed that, they've put it in, and then they've linked it in. And if you want to find out who that was, then you can click and find out about this person. So we are building tools now that just work in the browser with any sort of standard browser like this. 
which means that one day you might open up a reprint in, um, in uh, your Acrobat viewer and see that there are actually annotations on that article. Happened to be made by Anna. Um, and when you click, then you find yourself taken into the cloud and you find that, at least in Anna's view, that idea is inconsistent with that idea. Okay? So PDF documents coming alive, um, thanks to you, the Utopia team for creating that example for us. So what we are trying to do as a team, and which will be continuing here in KMI, and I'll be um, continuing in Sydney, is moving to the notion not just of collective intelligence, but contested collective intelligence. Because there is almost no domain where people don't have disagreements. And they're not having silly arguments, they're having important arguments. They're disagreeing for very good reasons. So the notion of contested knowledge and the idea that computers understand where people are disagreeing and why they're disagreeing is important to us. So CCI is, is an important concept. Here's an example from our current European Catalyst project um, for social innovation. So rather than people just posting an idea and people kind of vote them up and vote them down, um, you can now talk about the pros and the cons in the website. Or a more uh, a slightly richer system, uh, we want you to tell your story as a practitioner. For example, you might be a teacher who's tried something new in the classroom. You want to share what you've done. Um, and we give you a wizard that steps you through. It says, what's the issue? What claim are you going to make about what, well, what worked, what didn't work? Do you have any evidence? And maybe you've got some resources, some PowerPoint slides or some video that you want to link to. And you step through the wizard and you say, well, I've got a case study. I've got a story of change. And as you step through the wizard, then you generate, here are those icons again, questions, ideas, and pros and cons. Okay? It's the same DNA of the conversation, but in a slightly different form. Now it looks more like an outline tree. Okay? So we, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do you help people make these structured representations in an intuitive way. Because it's, it's a new literacy. It's a new way of reading and writing ideas. Um, it's very different from just hitting reply on Facebook or thumbs up or, or you know, plus one in Google. You have to think more carefully. You have to slow down. That's a bit more painful. But it's good for you. Uh, it's good for you if you're a student. It might even be good for the collective knowledge of the community of practice who are trying to pool the evidence they have on some important topic. And here's an example where a teacher filled in an innovation they'd been uh, developing to improve maths. And then there was a seminar where they came together, they talked about what they'd been doing. It was all captured on YouTube as well. And you can see some of the evidence that they presented in the evidence hub there. So where we are going is the fact that we can at last start to scale up the ability for people to share arguments in a structured form and then have computers make sense of them. So this rather busy picture basically is from our current European project. We have communities out there. We want to harness their collective intelligence, their views about some topic they care about passionately. Many of them will be using conventional websites and web forums, right? But we can, we can annotate and structure that and create these maps, which you will now recognize. Those are structured network representations, which we can, computers can make sense of much more easily. Those, the algorithms crunch, the cogs turn, and we start to generate summary visualizations about who's talking to who, which ideas are the most controversial, which we can then feed back to the people or to the moderators of those communities. So for the first time, moderators have some sense of what's the health of my community. Who's disagreeing? Um, who's lurking? Where, where has somebody posted a question but had no response? OK, the final chapter of my talk is around learning analytics. Uh, Martin's already introduced this as one of the areas I've been working in most recently. Learning analytics asks, can I tell from your digital traces if you're learning? In a nutshell. Right? More and more, the websites we use are trying to make sense of us. They're trying to build a profile of what we care about, what we'd like to learn about, uh, or rather what we'd like to buy. And they will be recommending you toasters that other people looked at when you looked at your toaster, and so forth. 
Okay? Recommendation engines, they are trying to make sense of this data. We leave this digital exhaust behind us everywhere we go now. Every time you use your, 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 your credit card or your store card, you're leaving traces. And now every learning tool has got to have an analytics dashboard. They will show you graphs and charts um, of how your students are doing. And when they rock up here trying to sell to the people who will make the purchasing decisions, they will show you dazzling dashboards. And the smart question, of course, is, well, what's it counting? And do we think that has anything to do with the kind of learning we care about? Right? So they're in every product. The concern amongst many is that technology is going to take us backwards. My Dutch wasn't any good, but Google told me, and I did check this with a real Dutch colleague, this is the huge difference between knowing and measuring. We have this living, organic, living, um, uh, beautiful thing on the left called learning. And computers, many fear, will chop that and dissect it and slice and dice it and tell you how many needles you have and how many twigs you have, and somehow that means you, you understand whether there's learning going on. Right? That is the fear you will find out there when you talk to learning, about learning analytics to many people. Done badly, it could be. Because computers have got all sorts of selling points. Scalable, very precise, they can quantify anything, and you can reprocess all that data and munge it with other data sets. The danger, of course, is that we've got completely the wrong metaphor here, and we could be laying waste to something that we care quite deeply about in an attempt to measure it. So a lot of the debates that I have now are around how are we going to use computers in a smart way to promote deep learning rather than counting silly things, but they're just the easy things to count, which, of course, is what afflicts our current examination systems in schools and to some extent in higher education as well. We have to be able to do something at scale in a rigorous way. There's only certain things we can count easily, so let's count those. So what kinds of analytics might point to the kinds of higher order qualities we want to see in our learners. Well, I think some of the work I've been telling you about gives you clues. We, we now have ways of making visible arguments and also filtering these arguments. Here I am filtering an, uh, uh, an argument tree by all the links to do with consistency in this case. Uh, so it's only showing me connections like supports, is analogous to, proves, is consistent with. Um, so we can filter these huge networks and make some sense of them. Uh, and learners can then look at the fact, oh, I haven't got any counter-arguments to my view. That might talk back to me and tell me something. Um, you can ask a software agent to watch the network for you. If there were hundreds or even thousands of people contributing to a network that represented our knowledge, how am I going to keep track of that? Well, we created agents that allow you to say, if anybody posts any evidence that challenges this idea, I'd really like to know about it. Right? You can't ask Google to do that right now. You can't ask any digital library to do that right now because these digital libraries have no clue about the kind of talk and discourse that's going on in all those documents. Here's work with Rebecca Ferguson um, in IET where we are trying to make sense of a two and a half hour text chat from an OU learning technology conference that was broadcast online. So there's all the text chat going on. Here are all the people and here are the slides that are being shown in the current talk. But where in that two and a half hour session were the interesting learning exchanges? Okay, so you need a theory of what's an interesting learning exchange. And we were building on the work that Neil Mercer and Karen Littleton have been doing here. Uh, Neil's, of course, in Cambridge now. They have a notion of exploratory talk, which is much better than simply agreeing with people or just asserting that I'm right and you're wrong. Exploratory talk is a way of offering ideas for critique, accepting critique, building on each other's ideas, challenging as well. And we trained a machine to recognize what looked like exploratory talk. What you see here is a visualization of the two and a half hour session. We showed the machine lots of examples of good exchanges and lots of examples of poor exchanges. And we said, can you figure out what the features of the good exchanges are? And with you know, quite high accuracy, you can see the details in the paper if you want to follow it up, it was able to do that. Now, the, long, the longer the bar, the more confident the computer was about its, its judgment. Okay? If it's a red bar, it thinks it's exploratory talk. That's good. 
If it's a blue bar, it didn't really pick up anything very significant. So at the beginning and the end of the session, there's not an awful lot of deep conversation going on. You know, people are just doing the usual thing, right? as you'd expect. Um, but if you zoom in on one of the peaks, then we were able to show statistically that it was spotting exchanges that humans agreed were good exchanges. And it might have been picking up on constructions like, I wonder if it's also. Yes, I take your point. I'm just wondering. I'd also like to point out. It's a way of talking and building knowledge together that we've studied online and has been shown to be more effective. Okay. Now, there are a lot of wrinkles around this kind of methodology. Humans read transcripts very differently from computers. It's one of the very interesting research questions that we're working on now. Um, but even a relatively you know, unintelligent computer was able to do this. We're also working with Xerox, who have been looking at the kinds of things you see in a scientific publication. People will use, expression, will use constructions like little is known about or current data is insufficient. They will say things like, in contrast with previous hypotheses, or they'll express surprise sometimes. We have identified unusual some things. Or this recent discovery suggests intriguing roles in da 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 da. And what we are trying to do with our students is teach them the rules of the game. You will never get anything published if you don't learn how to make your thinking visible in this way. If you don't say to the reviewer and the readers, this is a contribution I'm making. Right? It's called meta discourse. And Xerox have got this very interesting parser that can pick this out. We did some work. We thought, wow, that's interesting. We gave project reports from the Hewlett Foundation, big end of project reports. We asked a human to go through with the highlighter pen or Microsoft Word, highlight the passages that you think are interesting ones. Big report, an hour's work at least. Give it to Zip, which is the name of the Xerox parser. Two seconds. The machine, in this case, not every case, in this case, is picking out the same text that a human analyst thought was interesting as well. Right. Now, this, this could be a game changer in the way we read documents. Right? When Agnes at Xerox came up to me after one of my talks and said, I've got a machine that does that stuff that you're getting humans to do manually. You know, it's like your worst nightmare. Or, or, either, or the machines have finally caught up with us. Right? Very exciting. But we had, you know, we're now in the process of trying to understand how smart is this machine? And we know that people will read documents differently as well. They'll read between the lines and so forth. But we are getting clues here of analytics that get at higher order thinking and the kinds of linguistic use that we try and coach in our students. And uh, Doigu Shimshek is working on trying to take this technology and evaluate it in an OU context. And there's an example of some student writing which the parser picked out as two sentences to do with contrasting and here's a sentence which is, looks like some kind of a summary of what the, the, the student was saying. Okay. And with a technology like that, what we then have to do is evaluate its usability and what kind of impact it has on people. So we've done very, very close video analysis. This is from Bertrand Sereno's PhD, where we said, what happens when somebody is given a text that a machine is trying to highlight? And we, we study the reactions to that. So back to our big question. I'm very interested in what kinds of skills and dispositions we should be creating in our students. And um, one particular skill in that is the use of the right visual at the right moment. We're talking about collective intelligence. How can people make sense together? Some people have got the, right, the knack of standing up in a meeting and saying, take a look at this. And they draw something and suddenly clarity seems to emerge. What is going on when they do that? That was the question that Al Selvin asked in his PhD. I've got a little video to show you of everyday sense making starring Jackie, my wife, and Tom, where exactly the right thing happened. Tom came in with a compass. I don't understand how this works. What am I supposed to do with this? So we create immediately, Jackie started creating a little map on the table it's using badges southwest. of where we live. What if it's and being the academic geek I am, I had to whip my camera out and start filming this. <laughs> right? So we got little landmarks there. Or in the in-between bits, it always start north or south. So it's either northwest or northeast, or southwest or southeast. Or if it's a bit closer to south, you might say it's south-southeast. 
Okay, getting quite advanced there. Right, so, and by the end, Tom understood that when he walks north, he's heading towards school, and his friend lives east, right? So it's just a simple everyday example of how you can create the right representation at the right moment and bring clarity. So Al Selvin was studying how people use compendium, but this actually, we think, applies to anything. When you've got a practitioner who's got hands on the keyboard, how are they adding value to that meeting? They're dealing with all sorts of software and technology and methods and data. That just comes with the context of the meeting, right? That's what you have in your organization. Maybe there's no software. Maybe it's just flip charts, okay? People are talking about data, documents, previous projects. They're using a particular methodology, perhaps. But what is the experience of that guy who's trying to make a difference and add value? And the whole framework that Al developed talked about some very interesting things. That person is making artistic, aesthetic decisions. He is making, or she is making, ethical decisions. When should I jump into the, to the conversation? When should I change the course of conversation? They have to be aware of the unfolding narrative that's emerging prior to the meeting, going forwards as well. They have to deal and improvise with problems when something unexpected happens. Okay, and it's, it's, a, very, it's a very skilled job. My argument is this is one of the key skills that we need in the 21st century. How to help collectives make sense of a problem through appropriate representations. And we now have a language for talking about this that we never had before. So let's just go a little deeper on dispositions. A 16-year-old says, I know I'm bright and that I'm going to get good grades, but I worry I've become a tape recorder. I worry that once I'm out of school and people stop handing me information with questions, I'll be lost. This is the big worry within many of the uh, thought leaders within education now, at all levels of schooling and even within university. You know, if we are only turning out people who can pass exams, we've, we've really lost the plot. And many people are now arguing that dispositions are the third piece to knowledge and skills. In the innovation economy, we're talking about readiness to collaborate, attention to multiple perspectives, initiative, persistence, curiosity. Larry Rosenstock, who heads up High Tech High in San Diego, Carol Dweck, professor at Stanford. We need a growth mindset. Are you the kind of person who takes informed risks? Do you surround yourself with people who will challenge you or simply agree with you? John Seeley Brown, focusing on resilience. When you're challenged and bent, do you snap or can you bounce back stronger? Dispositions, again, are now at least as important as knowledge and skills. How do we cultivate those in our education system? So... I'm going to wrap up because I'm aware I'm close to time. But there is a whole movement now within the school system as well as within the higher ed sector talking about holistic university, holistic education. And um, uh, the Reinventors series is a great one to look at. And I have a colleague at Bristol, Ruth Deacon Crick, where I'm also a visiting fellow, who's developed a technique for measuring this through self-report. And we've been using this in the school in Bushfield to help provide a language for learners to talk about their learning. In fact, it's been piloted here at the OU already. Chris Edwards in IET has already been training ALs in how to coach students around a profile of this sort as part of retention. Could a computer help us with this? I think so. I've already shown you um, argument and discourse. Simon Knight is doing a PhD with me and asks... When people search, are they betraying their epistemic commitments? Are they betraying what they think counts as trustworthy knowledge? Maybe it's a window into the mind of the learner. And without reading it all, you know, you may have a very simplistic notion of what it means to know something, or you may have a more sophisticated notion. You may have a very simple idea about what it means to justify why you believe something, or a more sophisticated idea. Part of higher education is, of course, about trying to show students that there are many ways of seeing what the truth is. And I'll skip through that example. So where I think things could be going is that rather than fill in a questionnaire and get this profile, we're going to be mining the behavior of people so that we can get at their learning relationships, how well they are forming effective social networks, how well they are working in a team. Behavioral data, even somatic data from my fitness band could tell me how much am I sweating now Right? Um, if I'm working on my ability to give presentations, I hope that I'll see a downward graph eventually. What is the evidence of perseverance and grit 
and not giving up when I fail the first time. The computer knows that now, more and more. Meaning making, seeing the connection between what I'm learning now and what I've learned before. Well, if I start tagging and sharing resources on social media in new ways that are very different from my peers, I'm seeing something different from them. It's a clue. Critical curiosity. Am I questioning and arguing and pushing back? Am I displaying evidence of that? Or do I just take what I'm told and get on with it? So this is the kind of dashboard that we're envisaging. It's from a paper with Rebecca. It's a kind of mirror back to the learner. We are making visible things that used to be invisible, and we're asking them to reflect on that. And the work that I do with Bristol is going to continue in Sydney through the learningemergence.net website. So back, finally. We're in liminal space. We are in an uncomfortable space, but I think that technology has a role to play. Liminal space tools, we could call them, will help us grapple with uncertainty and complexity in all the different ways that I've been showing you today. And this is the agenda for me going forward. Thank you, everybody. None of this would be possible without you. I thought about putting photos up and naming you all, but I knew I'd miss people. But I'm so grateful for the time I've had here at the OU. And I'm in your debt. Thank you. Thanks for that, Simon. So I'm in a uh, nearly unique position, having worked in KMI with Simon for uh, nearly 19 years now. And it's tricky to sum up that uh, 19 years of work and what Simon means to the lab. Um, Simon, um, uh, I met him when we were having tea outside, and he said something to me which, for me, summarised part of our relationship. <laughs> when you work with someone for 19 years, you get to know them quite well, and you become quite low, especially if you've gone through um, tricky situations together. And he came up to me, shook my hands, and said, please be nice. <laughs> so I think I says, um, not that we have a... It says something about the closeness of our relationship and the honesty. So, so let me just give a, a small indication of um, what Simon has meant to KMI. So KMI was set up in 1995, as Martin has already said, and um, Simon um, came along when KMI was founded. And for me, um, reflecting, I use the World Cup lingo. I think it's part of a golden generation that came along in 1995. So there was Simon, Tammy Sumner, who's now the director of a big learning institute at the University of Colorado, and Peter Scott. So that, that's an awesome midfield, as, as I would say. And, and Simon's really uh, uh, contributed a lot. He's really been a, a leading light in KMI and, and really an important figure in all the success that KMI has had uh, um, over the 19 years. So he, I would say he's been an inspirational research and someone that I would encourage all the junior, junior researchers to copy. He's been a really fabulous person. So I'll just say a little bit about the contributions he's made. So um, you can see from his talk that he's had a tremendous impact. But if you look at the legacy of its work, it, it's really, really tremendous. A huge number of systems that are not just prototypes that computer scientists often build that are used for a few weeks and then thrown away when the paper's accepted, but his systems last for many, many years. Maybe JIME is maybe a decade old, other systems are, uh, are older. And um, even in the REF that we had, um, for the REF now, this research excellence framework where all academics are analysed and evaluated for their contribution, there's an impact part where you're measured. What's your non-academic input to, to the world? And Simon's compendium uh, impact case was the strongest, I would say, um, out of those in the computer science submission. And, and that's down to the approach that we say. So I would say um, uh, we think that you are a hacker. There is a hacking gene, <laughs> even if you deny it when, when, when you go. So um, he, he's made a, a number of contributions. One of the things that I really like about Simon is that uh, um, you, you get what it says on the tin. He, he, his research is very closely tied to his underlying motivational and also his personality. So he, he really 
believes in his work, and his beliefs really come out in his work, as you can see in his talk. So the, the Open Universities um, declared mission is to be open to people, places, methods, and ideas, promoting educational opportunity and social justice. And I would say that could have been written with Simon in, in mind. He, he really follows that. He's really a, a researcher with a, a strong moral compass. Another thing I would say is, is this phrase that comes to mind of, um, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Uh, I would say it's a contrast with Simon. So in the institution, which is the, one of the most inclusive on the planet, full of inclusive people, researchers, academics, non-academics, Simon stands out still as an inclusive person in everything that he does. Um, I remember working with him. He mentioned the Scalonto project that, uh, um, that he, he was leading and I was working on with um, Enrico. And I remember all the discussions that we would have with the team. And every time there was a decision, should we use this approach or that approach? Should we use statistics or semantics? Simon's answer was always both. Let's use it all. Let's put it all together. And, and I think the strength of the systems and their longevity comes from that. It really does. So, um, I mean, I even think that um, part of the reason is going to Australia is something to do with inclusiveness around there, just including the... He couldn't bear not to have the southern hemisphere included as well <laughs> in his work, so he has to go there and get that in. Um, another thing I would say is that uh, something that's very important in KMI is contributing to the uh, social and soul of the unit. And, and Simon, again, Simon has, has done this. So there's a couple of things that maybe not everybody knows. Um, he doesn't quite have the build, but he was the OU darts champion uh, a, a number of years ago. So it's a skill he said yeah, a while ago. And another skill that people may not know he has, um, he's a really good rapper, uh, and I don't take this lightly. So uh, in about 2000, we were involved in a six-university, £7.5 million project where about 50 people involved. And these plenary meetings that we would have um, with 50 people would start or end usually with a rap from, from Simon. And, and then there was an episode where we were at a summer school and there was a famous professor from um, the University of Manchester, Carol Goble, and um, she was about to get married when she left the school. So we said, oh, she needs a hen night, and then for the hen night we need a rap. So we phoned Simon. Simon, could you please write a rap? We need it within eight hours to this 50 cent tune. And, and he wrote it. In fact, I, I have the rap here, <laughs> Simon. So I'm not going to read it out, but uh, just in case you want to perform it before you, before you, you leave the OU or, or later today. So uh, it's fun something to do. Um, so I, I've been um, thinking, how, how can you capture uh, uh, um, the 19 years of, of working with Simon and all of his contributions and everything that he's done? And those very big questions following in the footsteps of Dung Engelbart. And um, so I have a confession to make, to, to close with, and no one knows this, Simon doesn't know, so I just confess it now. So um, I was thinking, how, how am I going to remember Simon? And for the last, I don't know how long, whenever I've seen Simon and thought about him, there's a song that comes into my head. Uh, so I'll just read out uh, a couple of verses. Um, it, it was used for a, a NAF advert, but ignore that. So I'll, I'll just uh, uh, um, read out the verse and, and see if it, it's resonant with you. So, I'd like to build the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to hold it in my arms and keep it company. I'd like to see the world for once all standing hand in hand and hear them echo through the hills for peace throughout the land. Bye-bye, Simon. We'll miss you.